Okay. My name is Colin Campbell. I'm a professor at Cornell University, a professor emeritus actually. And uh, it's really my honor to be able to be speaking to this conference uh, on um, lifestyle medicine. I know the focus is primarily on diabetes, but of course, uh, nutrition plays a major role in diabetes, as we all know. And in fact, I would suggest too that uh, lifestyle medicine as a concept, uh, at the center of the lifestyle medicine idea, it really has a lot to do with the food we eat, and of course, the nutrition that is produced uh, from. Uh, I'm going to go back and uh, tell something about my own experience in this field so that others can know where I get my ideas from. And uh, then I will gradually uh, work into a study that we did in China actually many years ago with my colleagues. Uh, but let me first off start out uh, defining nutrition. Um, I consider nutrition to be a somewhat different concept from food. Uh, obviously, diet is the kind of food we uh, routinely eat, um, and food is, of course, the foods. We all know what that is. But I don't want to speak about the biological ex the expression of food, and that's what's called nutrition. So when I speak of nutrition, I'm talking about what the food really does in our bodies after we consume it. And I will start out first with a uh, fairly major statement. It's a very provocative statement, but I believe this is true, that nutrition of a whole plant-based foods diet uh, minimizes disease and promotes health better than all the pills and procedures combined. I know that's a major statement. That's very provocative. But I've been in this business for decades now, and I've really come to know through my research and the research of others that we don't know enough about nutrition. The Western diet uh, that typically used in the United States and elsewhere, uh, now used more so in China, I should argue. The Western diet is, as we all know, is the, uh, we call it sometimes the standard American diet or SAD. Uh, that diet is rich in animal-based foods and addictive foods like salt, sugar, oil, and fat. But yet, even though I'm saying that I believe that this is true, uh, we really have a lot of evidence for this, nothing is so misunderstood and neglected in the health care world as that of the science of nutrition. Now, let me just walk you through a few slides on that. My, uh, my commentary is primarily going to be focused on the question concerning protein nutrition, and I first should start out by telling you a little bit about my own background because that plays a major role. We all think that protein is very, very important, and it's true. Protein is important. We need to consume a certain amount of protein. Uh, and most people tend to think that protein, uh, we're talking about protein from animal-based foods. So that's what I will be talking about, the effect of animal-based protein together with that plant-based protein on disease formation. But I want to first start out with uh, telling you that uh, I didn't start out in this field uh, when I was young, uh, believing in a plant-based diet. I was like everyone else. Uh, I was living in what we call a paradigm. Um, we all tend to think, of course, I think in countries across the world, that that protein is important and we tend to think it's animal-based. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the years before I got into the research and then what I did get into the research, I was raised on a farm, uh, basically milk and cows producing milk because it's rich in protein. And we all thought that was important. I didn't think about it really, to be honest about it, very much when I was young. But that's what the milk was for primarily is provide protein and calcium, especially protein in those days. Then I went away to Cornell University. I uh, did my doctoral dissertation uh, that was designed to actually promote the consumption of more animal-based protein. Then thirdly, after I took my faculty position at Virginia Tech University in Blacksburg, Virginia, 
I was given responsibility for coordinating a study that we had in the Philippines, uh, feeding malnourished children. A lot of countries in the world, poor countries obviously, had malnourished children. It was a big problem at that time, and still is today to a considerable extent. But we were doing a project in the Philippines to try to help develop a model for feeding malnourished children. At that time, uh, the idea was to make sure these children got enough protein. So my so-called paradigm, my background, as I say, like everyone else, is, is, is to believe in protein. Protein, protein, protein. The more we consume, the better. And as I said, most people tend to think of protein being present primarily in animal-based food. But then I saw something that uh, was really kind of provocative for me. Uh, I was actually uh, also uh, working on the question concerning liver cancer at the same time. And I thought I saw in the children, thanks to my colleagues, my medical colleagues in the Philippines, I thought and got the impression that the children consuming the most protein, and they were few, not many families, but the families consuming the most protein, uh, their children got the most liver cancer. That was very strange. I mean, we, we're in the Philippines and ensure the consumption of more protein, but yet a few families consuming the higher levels of protein were getting liver cancer. At least that's what I thought. Then I saw this pit paper here that I'm showing on the screen. <clears throat> there's, this, <clears throat> there's an experimental animal study that was done in India by the authors Mahadavan and Gopalan. Uh, and what they did, they did some studies in, in rats to see what effect protein would have on the formation of liver cancer. And what they, <coughs> excuse me, they thought that higher levels of protein, <coughs> the regular levels of protein, 20% of total calories, would protect against the cancer. What they saw was, you can see here on the screen, the animals given the regular protein, the good levels of protein, 100% got the cancer. The animals given lower levels of protein, just enough to keep them alive, those animals have got nothing. So here was a major, really major uh, departure from some of my thinking. More protein, more cancer. That was kind of shocking. Uh, and so we had a problem to resolve. Uh, I was in the Philippines. We're wanting to feed malnourished children, make sure that they get enough protein, especially high-quality protein if possible. But yet, on the other hand, here was this high protein associated maybe with more cancer. So I came back to my home university, <clears throat> got support from our National Institutes of Health to do some uh, research that lasted for many, many years. Uh, and I want to show you just a couple of things on that uh, on these early studies that really had a profound effect on my thinking. What I'm showing here is a graph uh, of the amount of cancer forming uh, versus the first 12 weeks during which the animals are consuming the uh, the uh, consuming the, uh, the protein. These cancers are started with a mutation. <coughs> a mutation of the gene. And so what I'm going to show you here is the results we got. <coughs> um, it turns out that when the animals were fed 20% protein, uh, the, the, the cancers are growing very well over the first 12 weeks. When they're fed 5%, like the Indian work has done, uh, the cancers aren't growing at all. <coughs> this was pretty remarkable. It was very similar to what the Indian work has done. More protein, regular levels, actually good levels, 20% of total calories, those cancers are growing. The group of animals that were fed 5% protein, the cancer did not grow. <coughs> then I saw something that was really pretty remarkable. We could change the diet during that uh, period of time. Uh, and and we, I was interested to see if we changed the diet, that we would change the development of the cancer. So during the first three weeks, uh, we fed 20% protein, and you can see the response there. Then we switched the animals to 5%. We turned the cancer off. Back on again, off again. For me, that was really remarkable because cancer was not considered 
uh, by me or virtually anyone else as being a function of nutrition. Rather, cancer was considered to be uh, a property of genes. So what we're showing here is the fact that even though these cancers are started with genes, the question of whether or not they get the cancer is a function of the protein. In this particular case, the higher levels of protein. And by the way, the protein we were using in these early studies many, many years ago, the protein that we were using uh, was casein, the main protein of cow's milk. So at least it is a general idea. Nutrition rather than genes primarily control cancer development. That was a really pretty remarkable idea at that time. It was something that was hard to believe. And we could turn cancer on by feeding more animal-based protein and, and turning it off by taking it or, or decreasing it. So the protein, as I said, was uh, casein, the main protein of cow's milk. Uh, we used that for some years, and then I uh, got interested in the idea, what would happen if we used uh, plant proteins? In this case, soy protein and wheat protein. What would happen if we gave the plant protein instead of the animal protein? They did not increase the precancer development, even when they were fed at 20% of calories. So again, here's a pretty remarkable observation. The animal-based protein turns the cancer on. The plant protein does not, even when it's fed at the higher level. So this would lead into a major consideration. Protein is not the same. It's very different when it's coming from animal-based sources compared to what it is when it comes from plant-based sources. Animal-based sources turning the cancer on. So the next one I, I want to show you is a little bit, well, how, if this is true, if this is true, then uh, how does it work? How does it work biochemically? Uh, and I'm going to show you a little scheme here to uh, summarize what we know about cancer. In this particular chart here, I'm showing this is a normal cell, okay? And this is the first phase of cancer. We call it initiation. In this particular case, the carcinogen, the chemical from the outside, is consumed. The carcinogen comes in and goes into the cell. When the carcinogen goes into the cell, at that point, an enzyme called the mixed function oxidase enzyme, that enzyme acts on this carcinogen to produce a less toxic product. That's why this enzyme is responsible for converting the carcinogen to a detoxified product that then is excreted. That's the way the body works. If we consume carcinogens, the enzyme comes and meets up with them and then it tries to detoxify them. However, in that reaction process, that enzyme makes a little bit of mistakes. There's an intermediate that's formed there that's very reactive chemically. It's an electrophilic metabolite and it binds to DNA and protein and some other compounds, but it binds to it and so when it binds to it to the DNA, that's the, that's the gene, that's the stuff of genes. When the carcinogen binds to the DNA, now we can consider we have a damaged gene, okay? This is going on all the time. When we are exposed to carcinogens of various kinds, the carcinogen comes in, it gets activated, and then it binds to the gene. But, and that's probably okay in, in the vast majority of cases because our cells, our body is able to repair the gene. Okay, so these things were forming a lot, but we have a mechanism to repair the gene. And the repair of the gene is very prominent. Now, but however, if the cell divides into a new cell, part of the reproductive process, if the cell divides into a new cell and that gene is not repaired, it becomes fixed. It becomes fixed. Now we have a damaged gene that is there for the new generation of cells. That's a problem because if that gene then is capable with that, with that change in the gene, may be capable of forming cancer. And so that's what happens. The fixed gene is there uh, and then it goes through a, uh, maybe a longer period of time. The cells divide, divide, divide until finally that we have a diagnosed cancer. That's the cancer cell. That phase is called promotion, growth, promoting growth of cancer. Like the DNA repair, the body reacts to this new cancer cell. It tries to get rid of it by an immune reaction, immune system reaction. And one of the things it does is to produce so-called natural killer cells. 
NK cells. They are there to uh, scavenge, to, to get rid of the cancer cells that, they, that we might be forming. So now to get to my point, uh, uh, here asking this question, how does this protein work? What I'm showing you here is when the protein is at a, at a high level, uh, and there's, by the way, there's three stages of cancer development. There's an initiation, that's the first stage, mutations. The second stage of promotions I showed you. The third stage is progression, that's the late stage. When in the case of humans, that's when usually the cancer is diagnosed. So we have three stages of the cancer development. I was interested to know uh, whether we could identify a biochemical reaction or biochemical mechanism to explain this protein effect. It was so dramatic that we had to know what it was. So what I'm showing you here in the first stage, in all of these, these are entries and I won't go into these details, but simply to show you that there were several mechanisms that might account for this protein effect shown here in white. All of these were increased with high protein feeding. They were increased, that meant more cancer. One reaction, that's the DNA repair reaction, it was decreased. So here's a good reaction protecting us and the, the high protein diet was actually decreasing the mechanism we have for protecting ourselves. That's the first stage. Then there's a second stage promotion. We look for some more mechanisms. We found some more mechanisms. They were all increased, the ones here in white were all increased by the high protein diet. That meant more cancer. Except in one case, that natural killer cell activity, which is protective, it was decreased. So essentially what we had here, we, we had a total of 10 mechanisms. This took about 10 or 12 years, graduate students working on their doctoral dissertations. Uh, we, we learned that there were about 10 mechanisms. Eight of them were increased, two were decreased. And the two that were decreased, were they should, have been, they should have been increased, but they were decreased. The high protein diet, all of them, it increased all these ones that increased cancer, it decreased the two that was actually protecting us from getting cancer. So we had 10 mechanisms, all doing the same thing. This is another major idea. I got the impression, therefore, that when something comes along like a chemical carcinogen or a cause of a disease, it does not act on one mechanism. It does not act on one mechanism. That's a fundamental assumption of the drug industry. What we were seeing here is that this one protein, this one nutrient, operates through multiple mechanisms at the same time. So, okay, so that's my background in, in the laboratory. And obviously, I could tell about 100 times more slides like that than I want. This is just to illustrate. But what I was learning is that this effect of nutrition in the form of protein in this case, this effect of nutrition was very dramatic. It was at that time then I was uh, very fortunate to have a visitor to my laboratory in the early 1980s, uh, Dr. Chen Zhu Shu here, uh, who spent uh, almost a year working in my laboratory doing some research and, and uh, he, we learned when he was there that another one of his friends, Dr. Li Zhengyao of the Cancer Institute in Beijing, had access to a lot of information on how much cancer occurs in China. That study was actually uh, suggested by the late Premier Zhou Enlai. So I met with Dr. Li, uh, Dr. Chen, and uh, myself, and then we had another member of our team, uh, Sir Richard Pito at the University of Oxford, a fantastic really brilliant biostatistician. Um, and uh, so, I'm sorry, I went backwards here. This. Yes, uh, so that was the project that was done in 1983-84. The project then was repeated. The survey was then repeated again in 1989. This time it included uh, the same counties, but it also included the uh, areas in Taiwan as well. And therefore, we added some other principal investigators and their teams, Dr. Wenhan Pan, who was a former student of mine at Cornell, and Liu Baoqi uh, from uh, Beijing. And overseeing all of this, I really want to honor and to uh, respect uh, Madam Chen Chomeng, who was the leader of the, uh, uh, the Preventive Medicine Institute in Beijing, and Madam Li Bing, who was in charge of the uh, Institute of Cancer. 
so these two these two women, uh, one of them visited with us at Cornell University, uh, all together, especially Dr. Chen Zhengshu, who headed up the study in China. We did a study. Now I want to show you something about that study. That study, in turn, related to what I was doing at the laboratory. Okay. So the first project that we did in 1983-84 had 6,500 adults, 35 to 64 years, living in 130 villages across rural China. Dr. Chen organized a fantastic, an amazing group of investigators to work across China, collecting all kinds of samples, blood samples, urine samples, food samples, and so forth, asking questions. And we ended up with a total of 367 variables or diet and lifestyle factors that we could consider. And my interest was, of all these dietary factors, I wanted to see if what we were seeing in the laboratory was maybe the same as what we might see in the human case. And so this was eventually published. Here I can show here, diet, lifestyle, and mortality in China. It was both in Chinese and English. And uh, the authors were the ones I just showed you before, Dr. Chen, and here is the lead author. Um, and I can't say enough about Dr. Chen. He was really fantastic in the way he organized the team to do this work. A lot of this was all collected together, uh, and then it was put into a computer forum in uh, Oxford University in England with Dr. Silver Shapiro and his colleagues. And we, we, of course, were involved in that too. And so every one of these 367 variables, that's a lot. I was the most in the history of medicine, I was told. We had 367 variables. Every single one had two pages. This happens to be a page for serum cholesterol. There's the original data. Just below that is every variable is correlated with every other variable. That's all that information. And then we had various ways to display how this showed. So that was the, became known as the China study, essentially. Raw data correlations and distributions. Later in 1989 uh, was repeated, and the second time it was repeated, as I said, with Taiwan. In this case, it was 170 villages, including eight more in the same villages, plus eight more in China, plus the 32 villages in Taiwan, or areas as they called them. Uh, and we had the total number of individuals, 8,900 8, 8, individuals. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this about these studies here, because uh, this was a major, major uh, event as far as I was concerned, because we were, in this case, exploring the effect of, of uh, this diet, this high-protein-based diet uh, in this human population. In the first case, so all in rural China. In the second case, also in rural China, but also adding the additional villages in uh, Taiwan. Now, at the time this study was done, uh, there was information in the West about a relationship between diet and various kinds of cancers, such as what I show here. This shows the relationship between total fat intake for different countries across the world. Total fat intake, which incidentally turns out to be equivalent to protein, but in any case, the total fat intake was uh, compared for different countries. This is breast cancer in the y-axis, um, and uh, the amount of uh, fat intake or protein on the x-axis. And so for these different countries, what we knew in the West at the time we started the China study was all coming from uh, focused studies in Western countries on this line here, really interesting line. Then when we looked at other countries, a lot of other countries that continued on down. China at that time did not have the data for this. Uh, this was published in 1975. So when we did the survey in China, uh, the information then was it gave us an opportunity to see if the line that's observed up here and all down through here, to see if that regression line continued on down to very low levels. So the China project, the China project was extremely important because it filled in a gap. It told us, it gave us information whether the dietary effect on disease formation, uh, you know, did the whole thing, all the way from the Western experience to the rural Chinese experience. Now, in the China uh, experience itself, uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things here that I found absolutely fascinating that re really relates to the role of nutrition in our lifestyle. 
Um, the, among the many disease rates that we had uh, that were provided to us by the Ministry of Health in China, among the, the various uh, mortality rates that we had for those different diseases, it turns out that these diseases divided geographically into two groups. On the one side, we had diseases that are sometimes called poverty diseases or diseases found in rural areas. You can see these are infectious and communicable diseases, bacterial diseases. Over here on the right, uh, these are diseases tend to be seen in Western countries, different cancers, leukemia, diabetes, coronary, there's diabetes, by the way, diabetes in the same class, it's coronary diseases and, and other kinds of cancers, liver cancer is one of those interests in. So these diseases here occur in the West and these in the more affluent, if you say, or economically developed areas of the world. These are in the, 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 in the rural, uh, more poverty, impoverished areas of the world. It turned out that every one of these diseases here, statistically, were correlated with diseases in its own list. In other words, lung cancer is correlated with all these different diseases here. These are correlated with each other disease in this list, and these are inversely correlated with diseases in this list. So it was a really, it was a very exciting proposition. Diseases typically seen in Western countries all group together. They occur in the more or less the same areas. And in China, these were in the more, more um, uh, semi-urban areas. We, all of our counties in China were the rural areas, except for some were near the more urban areas. And so this, this kind of, these kind of diseases, we started to begin to see these in those areas. That in turn, this group of diseases was elevated with blood cholesterol. That was, it may, this might sound like strange, but that was really quite remarkable because the level, as the blood cholesterol went up, these diseases began to appear. It's very simple. Cholesterol was up, these began to appear. So therefore, the question is, what causes cholesterol levels to go up? Well, in the West, you know, we tended to talk about saturated fat, although there was evidence that animal protein was responsible for that. So this was highly significant. Elevated blood cholesterol, these uh, Western kinds of diseases. Now, let me show you the significance of that for, for, for China. The cholesterol levels in China were quite low, very low, in fact, compared to Western countries at that time. A low of 90 milligrams per deciliter up to 170. That mean was 127. Actually, this, this mean was so low that when I first saw it, I thought maybe it was a mistake because in the West, we're accustomed to seeing much higher levels. So we went back and we, it was analyzed in Beijing, it was analyzed at Cornell, it was analyzed in Oxford. We got essentially the same number. So the range of cholesterol in the blood was this in rural China. In turn, this was driven upwards. The cholesterol level gradually increased in these counties as a function of animal protein. In other words, as animal protein started to be added to the diet in some areas, more so than some others, as animal protein was being added more and more for different counties, that in turn was driving up the cholesterol levels from 90 up to 170. That was similar to what we see in the United States. The range in the United States at that time for the population was from maybe 165 or something like that up to 270. So the low in the United States was near the high in rural China. And of course, the mean is this. Okay, so what we see in the United States and other Western countries, as the cholesterol level goes up from 165 to two, something like that, goes up here, this is a function of increased consumption of fat and animal foods. So what I'm saying here is that what we're learning in rural China, in that part of the curve, we're learning that the the cause, the dietary cause of increasing cholesterol levels was the same as we see up here. So what it says, rather importantly, is that starting from very low levels of intake of animal protein, the blood cholesterol starts increasing and these diseases begin to appear, in addition to a lot of other things as well, of course. Now I want to show you, just to make that point, I want to show you a bunch of slides, a bunch of graphs here of different researchers around the world at that time who had looked at the relationship between, let's say, animal protein and cancer. This is breast cancer mortality. That's the slide more or less I showed before. 
the one I showed before was total fat, but this here is animal protein. You see this relationship? It goes right through this origin XY. What it says is as soon as animal protein is added to the diet, in theory, breast cancer mortality is going to be increased. So I'm just copying these as they work. When the plant protein is, is done, then we don't see a relationship. There's no relationship between plant protein consumption and breast cancer, only animal protein. So there's some more studies. Here is animal protein and breast cancer incidence, not mortality. Here's uterine cancer incidence, colon cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer. Here's one for heart disease. The same, we see the same thing. Without going into the details, what all these slides show is something very similar. As soon as animal protein is being added to the diet, as soon, and it takes a very small amount, as, the, as our data from rural China showed, as soon as we start adding animal protein to the diet, we see an increase in the risk of various systemic diseases, all virtually the same. That was really a very exciting uh, proposition. The only one, now some of these slides, by the way, uh, they publish it under a different name, like, you know, skim milk or, or meat and such like that, or cholesterol. Um, but really, it was a, a question concern was oh, really animal protein that did this. So I want to bring it then back. Now, now, so now I have in the laboratory this information that animal protein turns on cancer. I have in the laboratory, too, that also increases blood cholesterol levels, and other workers have done the same thing. Now, we showed you, I showed you very briefly what we found in China. So I'm going to bring you back to the main thesis of my point. Nutrition of whole plant-based foods minimizes disease and promotes health better than all the pills and procedures combined. This is an example of Western medicine versus Eastern medicine. And in the, the time that I had available to me for over 20 years in China working, I, I really learned a lot. I, I'm very grateful for my Chinese colleagues sharing with me their ideas, even from ancient China, of how uh, the relationship between food and disease, you know, had been considered. Uh, and it was, the, it was the Chinese way and for many, many of those years. Uh, I was representing Western medicine, and they were talking about Eastern medicine, and it was a combination of the two. It was really beautiful. It was a combination of the two. When we can consider the evidence from both areas of the world like that, we can really learn a lot. Now, I want to, with that in mind, I, I really began to appreciate that nutrition is really, really important. It's really it's central. It's central to lifestyle medicine. If we eat the right food, if we eat the right food, we will not get the kind of Western diseases or diseases in many cases, diseases in general, that we do get now that are so costly, so costly in terms of deaths, in terms of cost of, of medical care and so forth. One, one uh, group of diseases that is not, has not been in that uh, discussion is the uh, viral diseases. So I'm gonna share with you something about the current COVID crisis, a viral disease. And I want to make a suggestion, based on the data we collected in China, I want to make a suggestion that the kind of diet that prevents the degenerative diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cancer and so forth, the same kind of diet has a major benefit for the viral diseases as well. And the reason I'm making that statement, I wanted to share it with you the data we got from the China study on that point. And I'm going to specifically refer to the hepatitis B virus a causation of liver cancer. Some people uh, emphasize that hepatitis B virus is the most deadly virus in the world today. It's more deadly than the coronavirus. It's a very serious virus. Uh, primary liver cancer tends to occur primarily in Asian and African countries, although it's becoming more common in Western countries too. In any case, the virus is widespread. It's been a very difficult virus. And here's the way schematically it works. We have the virus here out in the community, and this is a, called a surface antigen, hepatitis B surface antigen. That's the, that's the, that represents the virus out here in the community. It comes and invades our body, the human body, for example. When it comes and invades us without symptoms at that point, it's positive. 
So is hepatitis B for surface antigen positive? No symptoms yet, okay? When the virus comes and lands in our body, if you will, then it can starts to do its damage by causing liver cancer, for example, in this case, other kind of viruses cause many other different kind of conditions. The COVID virus causes lung problems in that, in that, uh, particularly in that case. But the virus comes in, it's in the body, it's asymptomatic, and it forms, eventually forms the symptoms, liver cancer in this case. Or it can be immunized. In other words, we can get develop immunity against the virus, antibodies. So now taking that model, let me show you what we found in the China study. I wanted to know in particular, what kind of nutrition favors virus immunity? Well, in this study, we had a lot of information on nutritional factors. We collected information of fiber intake and protein intake and calcium intake, and we measured things in the blood, all kinds of things like that. From the animal and plant base, it was spent. It was a really beautiful collection of information. So we had nutritional factors to compare with, let's say, people who had the antigen, to compare with people who had the antibody, as well as people who actually got the liver cancer. So what did we learn? Now, I, I don't want to make this too complicated, what that chart I just showed you is up here small, up in the upper left-hand corner. So I'm just going to take a talk about a part of it. Um, this is antigen going to antibody, okay? This is the hepatitis virus in this particular case. I show here degrees of statistical significance. So all the data I'm showing you is all highly significant. The antigen in the case of hepatitis virus is caused liver cancer. Otherwise, it could form antibodies. So what did we learn? More plant food in that study. More plant food. That was the second time we did this China study. Uh, it was associated with less antigen. So the plant food is converting, it, it, it's decreasing the antigen when it comes in the body. That was indicated by these things here, plant protein, vitamin, dietary fiber. All, the, all of these you can see they're statistically significant at the PO1 level. So as people consume more of these of plant food, as indicated here, more plant food, significantly so, they get less of the active virus. So it kind of goes down. In contrast, as people consume more plant food, it, the antibody goes up. So here's what the plant food is doing. It's shifting. The virus comes in. People consuming more plant food, they have a benefit because the virus is going to be immunized. The immunity is going to tend to form, as, as shown here. This is indicated by, sorry. This is indicated by these factors here, these plant factors. More dietary fiber, more plant protein in the diet, that's the visa, more antibody. More vegetables, highly significant, P-O-O-1. People consuming more vegetables in China, therefore, were much more likely to have antibody immunization. Okay? That's for plant food. Now, animal food. Animal food does exactly the opposite with these correlations here. Animal food favors the presence of the antigen, which causes liver cancer. Animal food also sort of does not help to, is, to encourage your antibody formation. That's indicated here. More animal food, you get more antigen, as indicated by more of that low cholesterol level as it starts to go up, and less antibody. Really, really, very exciting. And, and notice this here, too. Animal food or the antigen is correlated with liver cancer, highly correlated. Okay, it's up there. The animal food is. In contrast, the vegetables are what favors the formation of antibodies. So we have animal-based foods, many more than I have here. Animal-based foods favors the retention of the virus in its active form, whereas plant-based foods favor the, uh, the formation of the antibody. So animal food is pushing up antigen and pushing down the antibody formation. Really very striking. This combination of these correlations, all statistically significant. I mean, it's going to be an accident. This is what happens. Liver cancer tends to occur in China 
from those people who are using some animal foods. The more, the worse it gets. If they consume more plant-based foods, of course, they are protected against it. So now I'm going to switch this. I'm going to say, okay, this might apply to the COVID-19 uh, business now. I'm taking the hepatitis virus research that I just showed you, uh, and I'm going to just represent now, let's say, the COVID-19. We have the COVID-19 antigen, that's the active virus in the community. It comes and infects us. We test positive. At that point in time, if the antigen is not uh, immune, if the immunity does not form, then we're going to get the, the condensed the symptoms from uh, COVID-19, just like with the, the hepatitis virus. However, if we, in theory, I'm suggesting people can some more plant-based foods, they are the ones that are going to uh, see immunity from the virus. Now, some people might say, wait a minute, this, this, is, this is a stretch. I'm talking about hepatitis virus, the case of the China study, but here I'm talking about a coronavirus, two different viruses. They cause different things. Here's the thing to remember. That is absolutely true. Viruses have, all have different endpoints, but they all proceed through the immune system. So what effect the diet has on the immune system generally has an effect in one way or another, various kinds of mechanisms on another. So I'm suggesting that what we learned in the hepatitis virus research in China also applies to the coronavirus. We just it can't be absolutely positive, but I, I'm sure of one thing. If people were to switch to a plant-based diet who are maybe just testing positive, the diet acts very fast. We have evidence that it, it begins to increase cholesterol levels in a matter of one to two days. It decreases our need for insulin in case of diabetics very dramatically within one day. Putting people on a whole food plant-based diet decreases the need for uh, medications, uh, insulin-like medications for diabetes. So it does it. It acts very fast. So with this model here for the coronavirus, I'm going to say that uh, the whole food plant-based diet, if people did this, they're much more likely to become, to get immunity to it. And they don't get, and therefore not get the symptoms because that is very fast, as I said. Uh, in contrast, people consume a whole food plant-based diet. Let's say they're infected with the coronavirus, more antigen. It does not go on to form the symptoms. So the whole food plant-based diet is making the, the virus go this way toward immunity, less towards the symptoms. That's what it did with the hepatitis virus. So as I say, the whole food plant-based effect can we know from other studies, it only takes one to five days for this these effects to begin to show up. They're very dramatic, quite frankly. There's one more part of this story I want to share with you. And that is that people who are getting the coronavirus disease, suffering its consequences, they tend to be older, about 60 years of age. You know, in the West at least, 95% of these people have poor nutrition. They're the ones that get degenerative diseases. So they have poor nutrition, they form degenerative diseases. The people who are already diagnosed with degenerative diseases, suffering from degenerative diseases, they are more susceptible to the viral diseases. So the coronavirus comes along. These people are very susceptible. They are the ones that are suffering from the coronavirus more than anyone else. It's a condition called comorbidity. I'm sure it's familiar to everyone. Uh, we have more morbidity conditions here. These people are susceptible. They're going to have some of the consequences of coronavirus. And the whole food plant by diet blocks both of these. So if people are using this kind of diet, they're less likely to get this. This is for sure. In fact, we can reverse these diseases with this. Heart disease, diabetes, and so forth. And it also blocks, in this case, the data I just showed you, at least for the hepatitis virus, I'm going to suggest the whole food plant based diet does the same thing with viral diseases. All we need to do is understand the power of this whole food plant based diet as a means of controlling disease formation. And we should stay with it. This is not a something we, okay, we do it today, tomorrow, maybe for a week or two, and then leave it. We have to get, we have to use it, become accustomed to it. It has a very powerful effect. And just in case immunity forms and then it reverses, the whole food plant-based diet will prevent that in theory. So once again, I remind us, 
of the, of the statement I made in the beginning. Nutrition of whole plant-based foods minimizes disease, promotes health better than all the pills and procedures combined. And now I'm going to suggest that in addition to degenerative diseases and a better physical performance, we can put in this mix to viral diseases as well. Now, this was uh, published initially. Uh, my work was published in what I call the China study. That was not my preference for a title. I didn't have that interest at the time, but the publisher really wanted to name it that because our, our work in China with Dr. Chen and others uh, had become quite well known, and he wanted to make sure we could sell the book, so we called it the China study. Uh, this book uh, summarizes uh, all the work I had done over those 50 years at that time. Uh, and there's one chapter and one major chapter in there on the China project itself. As I said before, my research was mostly in the laboratory, some of it was in the Philippines, elsewhere, We've done all kinds of work. And we finally had this chance to work in China with Dr. Chen and his colleagues. I can't tell you how important that really was. I'm really grateful to the Chinese for actually making this possible. This, this, and of course, with Oxford University helping too. So the China study was published in 2005. Now it was republished in 2016. Uh, actually, it said two million. This, this book now has sold more than three million copies around the world and has been translated into more than 50 foreign languages. It's really done quite well. Uh, there is a Chinese version we have available as well as, uh, as one knows. So let me come back and make one uh, sort of summarization of uh, this, this whole effect of nutrition. You know, we, we tend to think of nutrition, unfortunately, we, in, the, in the profession, I don't know, any country, we, we tend to think of nutrition in terms of individual nutrients and what they can do, which makes us think that by the supplements are good, there's one way to go. That's not true. It's really the whole food. It's the whole food. The whole food kind of nutrition is multiple nutrients operating. I call it holist with the W. It, all these nutrients are working together. Multiple mechanisms, that's why I showed you the multiple mechanisms. These nutrients are all working with infinite numbers of mechanisms working together to ha affect a variety of diseases, diabetes, heart disease, and all the rest. Multiple health improvement. And at the cellular level, at the, at the, within the body, at the physiological level, all of this stuff is going on in a highly integrated manner, almost like a great symphony like a, in harmony, it's like great music. When we're consuming whole food, we have infinite numbers of mechanisms and, and, and uh, nutrients and other sorts of things all working together. That's nature, that's nature. This principle of nutrition, I'm going to suggest too, it applies to all ethnic cuisines. There's not one formula here for Western countries and one formula for Asian countries and so forth, no. We, we can, whichever country one happens to be in, we can maintain and retain, we can retain the ethnic a tradition of that particular population and do the same thing. We, we just do it through the use of herbs and spices and so forth and so on, flavor it, mix and match with foods and, and so forth. So this whole nutrition is really applicable to lifestyle. It's applicable to countries around the world in the same sort of way. And it's applicable, as far as I'm concerned, from the data we now have, to a whole variety of diseases. So people who use a whole food plant based diet live longer. We've got really good evidence on that from some years ago from the so-called Seventh-day Adventist study. Uh, so it, it's really an amazing effect. I'd like to reduce this to this story. From the scientific point of view, it's extraordinarily complicated, very complex. We, we work in all these little details of all these different mechanisms. We try to synthesize all kinds of drugs to target a certain mechanism. We work on one disease at a time. That may be okay in some cases too, for sure. But I would like to reduce it to a simple, simple message for lifestyle, for lifestyle medicine. Just two goals, consume whole foods and just consume them as plants. This is very simple. I, I don't like to get caught up in talking about all the little details of exactly how much um, fat or how much protein or this kind of um, uh, fiber or whatever. Those, those can be important in, in some cases, maybe, in a, but in a very small way. 
what really matters, the first and most important thing we can do if we want to export this lifestyle medicine. It's one Can message or two, two uh, recommendations. Consume whole foods and get them from plants. It's that simple. And the results that we get you know, from avoidance of disease and promotion of health is really quite spectacular. I wrote a second book called Whole, which elaborates, uh, you know, this concept of things working together, and it came out in 2016. And this is a new book that I just now, in, in two weeks' time, is going to be released. Uh, I'm talking about the future of nutrition there. Um, and in that book, I was called uh, with my uh, grandson, Nelson Diesel, by the way. But in that book, I'm trying to summarize the 65 years I've had in science not only the laboratory, but also in studies, working across different countries, and in policy development. And what I have seen, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of friends and colleagues who made this possible for me, but I've seen the, the, the entire gamut of disease formation and health occurrence from different kinds of perspectives. And I'm going to suggest we now have, we now have enough information to make nutrition the centerpiece to make nutrition the centerpiece of lifestyle medicine. I think it's a really a tremendous opportunity. I would, I would be remiss if I didn't also add, uh, we have an online course. Uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate here or not, but this online course is with Cornell University. Now, I don't get any pay for this, by the way, I should say. <laughs> it's, it's an online course, nonprofit, uh, and has really done, been quite successful. We're trying to develop this story. Thank you very much.